as I mentioned and teased at the beginning, we have a very special guest, former Bengals defensive back, member of the 1988 Super Bowl team. You've seen him call games on CBS. You've seen him work with Pro Football Focus, and he is also now working with the Believe Podcast Network, the Believe in Bengals podcast, a great show with another Bengals defensive back, Pac-Man Jones. We have Solomon Wilcots joining us once again. It's been a couple of years since he's been on the program. Mr. Wilcots, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? Guys, I'm doing great, and uh, thanks for having me on. Of course. I, I know you're a really busy guy. You're on the road. You mentioned you were coming from Colts camp. Want to definitely be cognizant of the time, but we want to get your take on a lot of different stuff as it pertains to the Bengals. And I'm just going to get right into it. And we'll start kind of going back into last year and kind of re- fast forward into the into the present, I suppose. But how surprised were you at the Bengals' ascension last year to the Super Bowl? I mean, I, I figured personally they were going to be competitive, potential playoff team. We'll see. But they, to me, they surprised a little bit, grew up a lot faster than I expected them to. Did you see this happening last year, or were you still thinking maybe it's a year or two away? Yeah, I would suggest that I thought it was a year or two away. There's no doubt about that. Um, I had tremendous questions and doubts about the offensive line. I felt it was an inadequate group for the team to have any sort of consistent um, achievement. I, I, you know, I kind of, after losses to the Jets and to the Chicago Bears, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I told you <laughs> so. You know, I was kicking myself and whatnot. Uh, the defense, um, what well, I thought would be improved, I didn't think it would continue to just surge and grow the way that it did. And I think any time you can beat the Chiefs twice within a span of a month and hold them to three points in the second half uh, of both games, uh, I, that's where the real overachievement came, and I don't think anyone could have predicted that part of it. Yeah, so then we get to free agency, and everyone knows that they're going to address the offensive line, and they did that with their free agency signings. Then they get to the draft, and a lot of people believe that they would take a cornerback early, but not many people pegged them to pick three defensive backs within the first five rounds, including two within the first couple of them. Were you surprised by that approach, and does it fit like where you saw – that defense trending in terms of where they needed help? No, I, I thought that's exactly where they needed help. And not only that, uh, you needed players who could be multiple in terms of playing multiple positions that would be highly flexible, particularly in the sub packages, the nickel, the dime. Um, I, I felt we needed a younger corner in our group to develop after addressing that area of free agency and, in multiple years with Trey Wayans, Eli Apple, Jadobia Woozy, um, McKenzie Alexander. I thought it's time to draft and groom one. So Cameron Taylor Britt was that. Um, and obviously Dax Hill at the back end of the first round, I thought was a huge get because of his versatility. Tyson Anderson is a bigger body guy, but still multiple uh, in terms of the positions that he can play. But all three guys, clocked a sub-4-4 four four in the range of 4-3 at the NFL scouting combine. So while we added versatility, we were also able to add speed to the back end. And the way that the Super Bowl ended, giving up the game-winning drive, um, you know, I, I felt like we could get better on the back end in our secondary. Well, I had a feeling you'd probably be pretty psyched about a handful of defensive backs being <laughs> being picked by your old team there, talking with Solomon Wilcox, former Bengals defensive back, member of the 1988 Super Bowl team, current host of the Believe in Bengals podcast with Pac-Man Jones. Of course, you've heard his Emmy Award winning voice calling NFL games and has been around the game for a long time. And in that vein, Solomon, I want to get your take on the Jesse Bates situation. I think we all kind of saw this coming, but I'd really like to get your perspective as a former NFL defensive back and you've been on the other side of the table calling games and and all of that I just kind of want to get your perspective on the Jesse Bates holdout and and do you see this thing really bleeding into the regular season or do you see him showing up when when it's really when the games really count and it, it's time to go you know uh yeah according to the collective bargaining agreement he's well within his rights to sit out of camp um, in order to um, maximize his opportunity to inherit uh, to inherit the benefits of you know having the franchise tag placed on him, as long as he shows up for game one, 
Um, he can show up for week one, and uh, after week one, that entire contract is gar- is guaranteed to him. Mm-hmm. So I, I think he's going to do that. I think he's still trying to negotiate a deal. I think the Bengals are wanting to get a deal done, um, but uh, they haven't been able to reach it. So he decides he's going to sit out of training camp, obviously doesn't want to get hurt. Even if he was here, <laughs> the Bengals wouldn't play him in the preseason anyway, right? Right. right. So I, I think it's it's kind of a stalemate. It's unfortunate. And now that the deal, Duran James uh, just received, um, you know, the highest uh, contract ever paid to a, a safety in NFL history, you should know that Derwin James and Jesse Bates have the same agent. So, yeah, um, yeah it's it, I think it's foreshadowing the things to come. We may be watching Jesse Bates, unfortunately, in the last year uh, with the Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah, and Bates was like, you know, he, 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 Bates was like us watching the preseason game kind of in the booth. He was in a l- little bit better seat, I think, a lot of us, but he was just watching that game. But there were a lot of other Bengals players that were playing in it. Just watching that first preseason game, what were your takeaways from the guys that were maybe competing for those roster spots? You had Jackson Carmen and Cordell Volson kind of battling out the left guard. Were there any players kind of on the back end of the roster that kind of caught your eye with, the, with that first preseason game? Oh, yeah, Kendrick Pryor, man. I mean, yeah. it, was, it, it was incredible. You love the way he carried himself and the way he made plays. Um, they had a couple of the young receivers I thought really played well. You had to be impressed with Dax Hill. The game did not appear to be too big for him. Same with the rookie Cordell Volson. I thought he um, acquitted himself very well, showing that I think he, I think Jackson Carmen's in a real battle. Um, if he's going to try to win the starting job at that left guard position, I, I think Cordell Volson is smart. He's tough. He's physical. Um, I like what he brings. He seems to love the game. It wasn't too big for him. But I can tell you guys, the real standout rookie is Zachary Carter. Mm. Pay attention to him now. The guy is phenomenal. We need uh, greater depth in terms of the rotation on our defensive line. I thought it was a huge selection uh, by Duke Tobin and the Cincinnati Bengals. I I think this guy is going to be a a good player for a very long time, and uh, he's going to exceed expectations. I think he's already caught the coach's eye, that's for sure. Talking with Solomon Wilcox, one of the hosts of the Believe in Bengals podcast, part of the Believe Podcast Network. He hosts that with Adam Pacman Jones, a great show, and we're grateful for his time joining us here on the Orange and Black Insider uh Solomon obviously preseason's a little different now abbreviated now that they eliminated one of the games you mentioned that the teams aren't really starting many of their starters if if really any at all um you know we we saw a lot of backups and fringe roster guys in in the first game probably a lot of the same in the second but I mean are the goals still the same from an evaluation standpoint in your eyes and coaching standpoint I mean is it going to be a little bit of a carbon copy this week against the Giants or do you see a little bit of tweaks here and there and, and some different goals for the team in preseason week two. No, I think it's going to be exactly what you saw week one. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're going to see all the backup guys, all the rookies. I mean, those guys that I just mentioned and the position battles that you have, I think those are the ones to pay attention to. And that's Jackson Carmen and Cordell Wilson. I think uh, Dax Hill is still going to get a lot of playing time um, because they need him to – play multiple positions and line up in different places. Then they're going to get him out of there. Cameron Taylor Britt, as you know, dealing with core injury, unfortunately. But that's going to open up doors for other guys. I, I think Trey Flowers is still, a, to me, a Swiss Army knife. That when you go up against the real big athletic tight ends in our league, he is the guy that sort of separates himself from everybody else. He's part safety, part corner, but he's a bigger, more rangy corner than all the other guys who still has excellent speed to run with a Darren Waller or a Travis Kelsey. Uh, I just, I really like him. So I'm sure they're going to want to see more from him as well, as well as some of these other young uh, receivers. Trent Taylor is a guy that I still think there's a future for him with this football team Mm. as our second slot guy. If something happened to Tyler Boyd. So that's what you're going to see. And remember, we have a week coming up where they're going to have a joint session with the Rams. That's where the veterans are going to get the lion's share of their work. 
And I don't think many of them, the uh, Jamar Chases, the Joe Burrows, the T. Higgins, I don't think you're even going to see them touch the field <laughs> in many of these preseason games. Well, speaking of Burrow and Higgins, they have something in common with you, Mr. Wilcots, and that they started a Super Bowl in their second year in the NFL. So not many people know what it's like to kind of achieve that success so early in your career. And just for the Bengals in general, they're a very young team, very much on the rise, but they achieved that level of success. And now they have to start kind of over again from square one as soon as the preseason ends. What in your mind kind of went through your mind when you went through the 1989 season to try to replicate that success? And what, what does it take for that team to kind of restart, hit the restart button and kind of build back up to where they were uh, six months ago? You know, I think what you do is you understand that the process um, and, and all the hard work, it, it really pays off for you. It, all it does, it validates what's required to win and do well. The only thing that you need to understand from there is just to remember what it took and be willing to pay the price. Um, you got, and I, you know, I said this last year, um, if you take a look at a Joe Mixon, a Joe Burrow, a Jamar Chase, a T. Higgins, okay? Even Tyler Boyd. Tyler Boyd played at Pitt with guys like Aaron Donald, okay? You know, these guys came from programs that won. They were they're used to winning. They don't care about what the Bengals did in the 90s or maybe what happened maybe a few years prior to their arrival. These guys are used to winning. And that's kind of how I felt when I got here, having come from University of Colorado, well, we had just turned the program around. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of years later, win a national championship. Listen, man, what, you get a taste of winning. That's all you want. And you'll, you'll do anything to keep it going. And so I, that's what I anticipate from this group. They, you know, even for some of the guys who had been here prior to the arrival of Joe Burrow, these guys, they don't want to go back to that. They want to, they want to keep this thing going. You heard Burrow say it last year. Get used to this because we're going to be doing this every single year. That tells you he wasn't even enamored by the first playoff win in three decades. He's like, look, we're going to be doing this for quite some time. <laughs> uh, you know, before we get your thoughts on on kind of an expansion on that and where the Bengals may be headed this year, what they need to do to maybe repeat and maybe even beyond AFC, you know, repeating as AFC champs, I just want to get your thoughts on the news that we received on Wednesday about Ken Riley as one of the finalists to the Hall of Fame. Uh, he retired a few years before you joined the Bengals, but I'm sure you have had the pleasure of meeting him before he passed away. And you know a lot about him and his history with the team. Finally looking like, I mean, there's still another step to go here, but finally looking like he will get his rightful place in Canton. Uh, your thoughts on that, being a fellow defensive back, probably knowing him and probably having met him uh, in your lifetime, obviously a great guy and a great football player. Oh, my goodness. Look, um, this is a guy that, you know, his nickname was the Rattler. <laughs> That's what Dick LeBeau used to always call him. He was a guy that we all looked up to, aspired to be. He set the lineage. Um, he was the first great shut down corner in Cincinnati Bengals history. Um, I think the number of interceptions, um, 63, I think it is, um, uh, for the career. Uh, very few people have, have gotten more. Uh, and if you look at it on the Hall of Fame list, uh, there are seven guys, I think, that are even on the interception list, seven guys ahead of them are, are all in the Hall of Fame. The next seven guys behind them are all in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. He's the only one in that top 15 who isn't in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> and, and no one can explain why. No one can. This is the same thing that Kenny, um, you know, that Ken Anderson suffers from, right? Yep. For whatever reason, you know, we're not a big market team. But the Cincinnati Bengals had early success under Paul Brown when he came in. Everybody knows about Bill Walsh and the legacy that he built here. Dick LeBeau. The zone blitz started here. The West Coast offense started here. Mm -hmm. Paul Brown, great. For whatever reason, the lack of Super Bowl titles and maybe playing in the division with, with Pittsburgh's won so many. For whatever reason, it's it, the great players, right, have been overlooked. They only mm -hmm. have Anthony Munoz, and rightfully so. He should be in there. Uh, but I, I think it's a program and an organization that has been overlooked. And because they're writers who get to vote, 
if they didn't cover the team or if they haven't covered the team back during periods of time where the great players flourished, they tend to be lost to history, and that's very unfortunate. Well, Solomon, before we hear about your uh, show and where to get it in uh, just a second here, what what do the Bengals need to do to repeat? Because they are they're now in a little bit of a different position than usual. They're usually the ones trying to keep up with the Joneses, but this year they are the Joneses, and all the AFC teams have kind of tried to emulate what they did and and uh, you know fight against what their roster, how their roster is built, and all of that. You mentioned how it is tough to repeat as AFC champions get back to the Super Bowl and win it. Uh, I guess your thoughts on where, you know, where this team's headed this year. I think a lot of people believe they'll be back in it, but it's not as easy as we all think it could can be, even with the roster looking as it does. You know, last year wasn't easy, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, here you go. We, we, were, we lost two straight home games um, and then fell to seven and six. A season could have went anywhere after losing – back-to-back home games to the Chargers and then the 49ers. And th- I mean, these games are hard to win. We lost games to two teams that the Jets mm-hmm. and the Bears, Yep. right? Uh, but then we beat the Denver Broncos and then you beat the Kansas City Chiefs and, next, you know, next thing you know, and the Raiders, and now we're looking a whole lot different. So I think the real key is, even for the fans to understand, winning in this league is hard. Mm-hmm. And it's not gonna. It's not gonna be easy. These games are gonna come down to the final moments. The kicks by Evan McPherson. Every single one of them are gonna be needed, just like they were last year. The the margins in our league are razor thin, and you just gotta keep stacking those moments late in games to close it out against no matter who you're playing. I don't care what the record is. It's gonna be a dogfight. I don't care how, how bad they are how good they are. Um, it's going to be a dog fight. And that's what you have to anticipate. And, you, and when some uh, lose, when you lose some and some slip away, you got to continue to believe in yourself and maintain confidence in your ability to go get it done. And I think the fans are going to have to maintain some confidence in this team and not get down on them if they have a moment or a game yeah. or a stretch of a couple of games where it doesn't turn out our way. Well, I can tell why you are an Emmy winner, Emmy winner, Solomon, because you use the word believe, and that is a great segue as we get you out of here because you are one of the hosts on the Believe in Bengals podcast with Pac-Man Jones. And some exciting news with that. It's going to be airing on Valley Sports Ohio this year is the, is the rumor here. So aside from finding it there, where else can you find the program? What do you got going ahead? And uh, we've, we've long worked with Cam and the others at the Believe Network, and we've had great experiences working with him and them and all of the special guests. So what do you guys got going on, and where can they find the show? Yeah, we have a great staff at at the Believe uh, Podcast Network. All you have to do is go to Believe.com, B-O-E-A-V.com, or wherever you get your podcast, whether it's Apple or Spotify. You can also catch us across YouTube, um, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, we're going to have fun this season. Um, we're going into our second year of the Believe in Bingo podcast. Um, it's also, as you said, going to be simulcast, going to air on Valley Sports Ohio, Channel 43, twice a week. Ooh. How about that? On Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> and so Adam Pacman Jones and I, we get, we're going to have great guests, going to get the players on, going to get the coaches on uh, to kind of keep you up to date on what's happening with the Bengals throughout the season. And we hope that we're going to go uh, all the way uh, to the Super Bowl in Phoenix, Arizona. So uh, we believe that the Believe in Bengal podcast is the go-to place for all of your Bengals coverage. Well, we appreciate it, Solomon. Uh, had had an opportunity to spend a little time with your co-host at the NFL Draft, and that was awesome. And this is awesome having you on the show. I told you this the last time you were on our show a couple of years ago. My brother was number 41 in high school because of you uh, on his football team. You were you were his guy, and uh, we can't thank you enough for joining us and giving us some time. Take care. I know you've been on the road. Appreciate your time, and we'll talk soon. Well, thanks for having me. And tell your brother, I said, keep up the faith. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, Mr. Wilcox. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. 
Uh, that's awesome. Solomon Wilcox. I, I'm telling you, that was that was my brother's guy, man. That was my brother's guy in, in high school. He's still uh, the first time we had him on. He was like, dude, you got to you got to tell him. I'm like, dude, I'm not telling him that. I'm not telling him <laughs> Jersey. Good God. But I did then and I did now. So that's for you there, Brandon. That's uh, I had to had to throw that in there. But good stuff from him, man. I, I uh, you you are ingrained in the Believe Network there, John, and they do a lot of great work. Great work. We had Ike Taylor and Mark Bergen on earlier. A lot of them during you know a lot of different guests. Joe Valerio was an awesome one. Mm. Uh, during, you know the AFC Championship. So thank you to Cam Rogers, the Believe Network. You got to go check out what they do. Um, great stuff. And of course, John's show with D and H daddy and Hoji, do, they do a great job as well. Bridget, uh, also does a lot of stuff with that show there too. So you got to check that out. But our thanks to Solomon Wilcott's one of our favorites. I always, I always enjoyed hearing him on, uh, the CBS broadcast, man. That was always a voice where I'm like, man, you know, and it always seemed to be those Browns Bengals games, the Carson yeah, Paul sure. Browns Bengals games. It was always <laughs> those games it would seem, but, uh, it was a pleasure having him on. I know he's, he's, you know, pretty tired being bounced around a little bit, going around to training camps and whatnot, but uh, we appreciate his time. One of the best dressed in the business too. Oh, yeah. when, when he was last on with us in the puppets, like, you know, he was just in his backyard, but like he was, he looked so sophisticated. Like he was well overdressed for the quality of show <laughs> that we put on for him. But yeah, like, like we, we started the, our, our podcast on believe. I don't know why believe invited us in the first place, but like, Hey, if, if these two puppets and this dude, can make it work then surely solomon wilcott's and adam freaking pac-man jones can make it work now pac-man's gonna be on tv two times a week i'm definitely checking that out <laughs> yeah for sure for sure <laughs> Pac-Man, he, he's not a bad dresser either in vegas no, he, was, he, was, uh, he was dressed to the nines as well man he was he was decked out well uh, thanks again to cam rogers at the believe network and of course to solomon wilcott's for joining us always a pleasure hearing from him and hopefully we can get him on again soon especially if the Bengals are doing similarly well this next season and it seems like we're all kind of thinking that they will but we'll we'll see what happens more